Hi everyone, welcome to Opportunity X Summer Camp Day 5. We're going to be talking about salt analysis and its applications on planets and other things like that. So, table of contents. Basically, this presentation is organized into four main parts. The first is background information, so the rationale behind this experiment or the reasons why we want to do it. The second is ex the actual experiment and the observation of its outcomes. And third is the discussion of kind of the advanced concepts that were involved in the experiment. And finally, we have the conclusions or the impact and the relevance of this experiment. Some background information. Ceres is a dwarf planet. It's the largest object in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter. And scientists discovered mysterious bright regions on it a while ago. So in 2015, NASA sent the Dawn spacecraft to orbit it and kind of investigate what's going on. Mars is the fourth planet from the sun named after the god of war. It's known for being red. Um, scientists believe that Mars used to have water on its surface, but they need to kind of find a way to evidence their theory because you can't really just say that Mars used to have water without solid evidence to prove it. So onto experiment materials. Feel free to pause the video if you need to go and grab them. So you need table salt, Epsom salt, baking soda is optional, two or three containers to mix solutions in, spoons, warm water, a transparent or dark colored bowl or plate. You could also use a plastic lid or saran wrap if you don't have those. Um, and finally, a paper to write predictions and observations down. So experiment procedures. The first step is to create two to three different solutions by dissolving salt into warm water. So you can create different solutions by dissolving different amounts of salt or different types of salt into the solution. So on the right, you can see some recommended salt ratios. And you can predict what happens when you leave the solutions out to dry. So a few questions that you might want to try asking are, how does the amount of salt affect the way that the solution dries? And how does the kind of salt affect the way that the solution dries? It might be a good idea to write your, your predictions down so that you can compare them to your observations later. So step three is drying out your solutions. So you place about one teaspoon of each solution onto a clear or dark colored container. To make them dry faster, you can place the dishes in direct sunlight or near another source of heat, but make sure to not place the dishes so close to a heat source that they melt. Another example of a heat source that you might want to use are maybe a microwave or a hairdryer. You can get creative with this, or if you or you can try just leaving it in direct sunlight. If I remember correctly, it took about eight hours for my solutions to dry. So the next step is to write down your observations by revisiting the questions that you asked in 2A and then answering them based off of your observations. So here you can. Here's a time lapse of basically a, a salt solution um, drying. You can feel free to watch this after the video ends, or you can just um, stop this video right now and watch it now. Okay. So what happened? As water evaporates, salt crystals started to appear. And this happens because when you're creating a solution, you're basically dissolving salt by using polarized water molecules to break ionic bonds that were holding the chlorine and the salt together. And crystals form when the water evaporates because since water molecules are polarized, as in they have a negative side, which is oxygen, and a positive side, which is hydrogen, um, there's, no, there's really no reason for the sodium and chlorine to stay apart anymore. So they come back together and it results in a crystal nucleus. Eventually, this crystal nucleus grows too large to remain in solvent condition, so it crystallizes by falling out of the solution. And other molecules continue attaching to the crystal and making it larger and larger until equilibrium between the molecules in the solution and the crystal is established. And on the right, you can see some pictures of the crystals. So we're going to be talking about the relevance of this experiment now. So going back to Ceres, um, the reason why um, Ceres was so interesting is because there are these strange bright spots all over Ceres' surface. And specifically, there are two reflective areas within the Ocator crater, where the, which were Seralia facula and Vinalia faculae. So faculae basically just means bright area. And another thing that's very interesting is since Ceres is exposed to micrometeorites, which darken the surface of the planet over time, 
The brightness of these two areas indicates that they are likely very young. So NASA, again, sent the Dawn spacecraft up in 2015 to kind of look at Ceres a little bit closer and figure out what was going on. Its lowest point was 22 miles above the surface, and we finally found out why Ceres has bright spots. So, what do you think the bright spots were? So Dawn did end up confirming that the bright regions were pretty young, as in under 2 million years old in some cases. Now, 2 million years might sound like quite a bit, um, considering how our um, how long our lifespan is, but in comparison to the solar system and just the universe in general, this is very, very young. And Dawn also found that geologic processes that were driving the deposits are possibly still active. So these bright spots on Ceres turned out to be salt. Um, more specifically, sodium chloride chemically bound with water and ammonium chloride. And these deposits likely came up from liquid that moved up to the surface and then evaporated, which left behind a highly reflective salt crust. Salt water dehydrates on Ceres' surface within hundreds of years. So that, so the fact that we found water still present in the deposits indicates, again, the youth of these deposits. Now we will have to take into consideration the fact that these deposits are so young. So there must be some kind of recent geological process that was causing all of this. Well, yes. So basically, these salt deposits are evidence for brine deposits and active geologic processes below the surface of Ceres. Specifically for Sorelia facula, the slushy area under the surface was melted by the heat that created this crater um, around 20 million years ago. And these cracks also formed um, upon impact. So what happened was um, all, of, all of these salt deposits were originally frozen and then the meteor impacted Ceres and then heated up that entire area to the point where um, these deposits could warm up enough to kind of get to the surface. Along with that, cracks were also formed by impact, which allowed for more water to seep up to the surface continually. Going on to Mars, um, basically, NASA's MRO, which is short for Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, found evidence, potentially, for intermittently flowing briny liquid water. So it, the MRO used imaging spectrometer and it detected these hydrated minerals in these very mysterious streaks. So you can see here some examples of, the, of these mysterious streaks. And what's interesting is that they seem to darken during warmer seasons and then kind of disappear a little bit during the cooler seasons. And they mostly appear when temperatures are larger than negative 10 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, another word for these are RSLs or recurring slope lineae and um, the presence of these hydrated salts in the um, in the water was found to be a mixture of magnesium percolate, magnesium chlorate, and sodium percolate. And you might think, well, ten degrees Fahrenheit, negative ten degrees Fahrenheit, might seem a little bit low in terms of um, in terms of temperature for there to be running water. However, um, salts have actually been found to kind of lower the freezing point of water. So for example, some percolates prevent freezing even at negative 94 degrees Fahrenheit. And this is very similar to how salt on roads makes ice and snow melt more rapidly. And all of this evidence is kind of indicative of a shallow subsurface flow. However, we still need to kind of investigate further before being able to say completely that there is running water on Mars. Now onto a very interesting theory that I thought was quite interesting. Um, this is basically just an example of the application of salt's reflective properties that I mentioned in the series part of this presentation. So this was suggested by Robert Nelson, who is a senior scientist at the Planetary Science Institute, and it's a slightly strange theory to battle climate change. So basically, the idea is to spread finely powdered salt throughout the upper troposphere, and the reason why Robert Nelson thought of this was because these large volcanic eruptions that have historic um, have historically shown to temporarily cool the planet because they produce these things called aerosols, which are very fine particles that go in the air and block any kind of like radiation from the sun. 
An example of this is an Icelandic um, volcano that caused the coldest summer in the northern hemisphere in 1,500 years after it erupted. And while experimenting, Robert Nelson found that these uh, these um, different aerosols were like either extremely um, toxic to humans or just in general not a good idea to spread in the air. However, he also found that table salt is more reflective than these other aerosols and also theoretically harmless to humans. So theoretically, the salt particles with the right shape wouldn't block outgoing infrared heat released by Earth, while also blocking ingoing infrared heat that was coming from the sun. However, there are some disclaimers. Um, there is quite a bit of chlorine in salt, which could contribute to destroying the ozone layer, which is not good because that would continually um, bring in higher and higher levels of radiation as well. And it and since salt is highly reactive to water, it could also affect the formation of clouds if you don't spread it high enough. So yeah, there are definitely some kinks to be worked out in this theory, but I think that this is a really um, good example of salt's reflective properties being used in real life. Okay, on to the pop quiz. What is the name of the aircraft that orbited Ceres? How is Seralia Focula getting its supply of brine? What do percolates do and why is it important? And finally, why is using salt to battle climate change risky? Feel free to stop the video if you wanna write down your answers. Okay, I'm gonna go on to the answers now. So what is the name of the aircraft that orbited Ceres? Dawn is the name. And how is Sorelia Focula getting its supply of brine? From slush that was melted by an asteroid impact millions of years ago, or fractures that allow brining water to seep up from underground deposits. What do percolates do and why is it important? They lower the freezing point of a liquid, which allows for the presence of liquid water at a lower temperature. And finally, why is using salt to battle climate change risky? It might affect clouds or it might dis destroy the ozone layer. Thank you for listening. I hope you guys learned from this lesson and be sure to check out the other videos on YouTube.